prayer. Father, we want to thank you for this, your Sabbath day. We're here to worship you. you. You're just not any God. You are God. You are the God of gods. And Father, you are the creator of this entire universe. So Father, as we come before you this morning, acknowledging you in your power and in your might, we understand that you are the one who created each one of us. You created this Sabbath day. You gave us the opportunity to worship you and to give honor and glory to you, our God and our King. And so, Lord, this morning, as we open your word, we invite your presence, not just in this place, but, Lord, in our hearts and our minds. Father, as we open your word, teach us, lead us through your word. Help us to understand the priorities, Lord, that you have for us. And most of all, Father, as we, um, as we worship you, may this, may this not only come from our hearts, but, but, but it may, be, may it be filled with your love and your grace. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I'd like us to, uh, to think about the, uh, the story, a very important story um, in the Bible, um, the story of, of Esther. And um, the reason I'd like us to focus on Esther this morning is because, for a number of reasons, uh, uh, hold on a second, my notes are going haywire here. Um, the reason that I'd like us to focus on Esther this morning is because I believe that the story of Esther um, has in it everything that, um, that encapsulates uh, what I would describe as a postmodern society like what we're living in today. You know, it's kind of interesting that I've noticed as I'm as over the last few years more and more people are becoming um, are becoming um, blase to the concept of become, being atheists or agnostics. And, and they're confident in that atheism and that, ag agno that agnostic stance to the point that as a Christian it's almost Im um, impossible for us to even say that we're a Christian. And that kind of disturbs me because of uh, the concept of being able to give everyone the right to believe as they choose. But that's another issue, amen? What I want us to think about this morning is how you and I as Christians, though, sh can live in that kind of environment. The interesting thing is that Esther, although a book written over two and a half thousand years ago, the interesting thing about the book is that it was written in a similar kind of situation. It was written um, about a story about a young lady who was living in captivity in a foreign nation. She's living, in, um, she's living in Assyria, and she's, she's living at a time when the, when the country of Israel, this, the, um, when the Jewish nation, were in, in captivity. But I want to share something else about this story, because I believe that Hollywood should actually have encapsulated this story and created a film. It's filled with drama, suspense, romance, murder, jealousy, and anger. There's heroes, there's villains, um, there's rich, there's poor, and there's even a happy ending. Amen? Just like every single story should have. But the interesting thing is in this story, that it's um, one of only two books that are dedicated to women in the whole Bible. So that's kind of interesting. What's also interesting is the name of God never appears once in the story. The story simply doesn't name God once. Now, we're gonna, as we get into the story, we're going to see how, how God is a very integral part of Esther's life. But the name of God never appears once in this story. So... It's a book, I believe, for our time, because it's a story about people who are dealing with a world that is anti-God. We're dealing with a world that is anti-God today. So here's the Reader's Digest version of the story. Amen? You're coming along with me this morning, because I want to get to the points rather than deal with the the de I want to get into the specifics rather than worrying about the whole big picture. Amen? So let's get into the big picture so we can get down and look at something very important. So if there's four main characters in this story. There's the king, there's um, Haman, the, pr the prime minister, there's Esther, and there's a righteous cousin, um, um, uncle, who's called Mordecai. 
And what happens is, the king, for whatever reason, and he had the power and authority to do this, the king decides that he is unhappy with his wife. And so he decides that he's going to divorce and get rid of the queen. He was the king. He had the power and the authority to do that, however correct or incorrect we think that is today. And, and so now, a little bit later, he's feeling lonely. Everybody can see that he needs somebody special in his life. I believe that the Assyrians were good Adventists in waiting because they get a committee together. And in the story, as they get this little committee together, they all decide how they're going to remedy the situation. They decide that the way to remedy it is very simple. What they'll do is they will send out a proclamation across the entire, um, uh, not just the nation, but across the entire empire, and they're going to go in a search for the most beautiful woman across the empire to be the, to be the queen. And that's what they do. They do these series of beauty pageants all over the empire and they, with, the pr with the purpose of finding the next queen. Mordecai and Esther have a conversation. And in this conversation, Mordecai encourages Esther to sign up for this, this, this process. And through the process of elimination, however rightly or wrongly we, we feel about this, through this process of elimination, Esther gets to the point where she is selected to be the queen. So just think about that. Here is this Jewish lady, this Jewish maiden. She is a, um, a captive in this country, and now she has become the queen of the empire. Just think about that for a second. Amen? Don't, you don't think that God can turn things around? It gets better than that. Mordecai, the uncle, this, this cousin uncle figure, Mordecai discovers that there is a plot to kill the king. And so now Mordecai gives the news um, to Esther just after she had become queen. The, the attempt is thwarted, it's prevented. And the interesting thing is, at that point, Mordecai should, was owed a reward. He should have received a reward for what had happened. You know, the interesting thing is, the king should have given him that reward, but he forgot. Friends, I want to make a point this morning. Be patient. As we deal with all the rights and the wrongs in this world, the reality is that God is ultimately in control. Amen? Amen. And, and yet, we fight sometimes for justice instead of fighting for God. God is in control. We'll talk about how God puts it right. But God can put things right at any point in time. He can put things right today, and He can put things right on the Day of Judgment, but the reality is God will put things right. Amen? And it will be His right and not our right. Can I hear an amen? amen. So here's what happens. Haman, this Prime Minister, this Prime Minister gets to the point where he, um, he, he realizes that people should be worshiping him. He's the Prime Minister. He's the second in command. He has all the authority and all the power that goes with it. But that wasn't enough for him. It wasn't enough for him to walk into a room and for people to look at him and say, look, there's the Prime Minister. That wasn't enough. He wanted actually more. And what he wanted was, he wanted people to actually bow and worship him as though he were a god. That's what he wanted. And so, the decree goes out that people are to worship him, and people were worshiping him, except one group of people. And every time he came to Mordecai, the Jew, Mordecai refused to worship him. 
In fact, Mordecai only says this. He says, I am a Jew. That's his simple response. He doesn't go into all the 27 fundamental beliefs. All he simply says is, I am a Jew. I'm a Christian. Amen? That's why I do Christian things. We're Christians. That's why, because we became followers of Christ, we do things that appear weird to this world, but we don't have to go into a great debate about why we do them. We don't have to explain in 101 different texts as to why we're here on Sabbath. Our job is to talk about Jesus. Amen? Jesus Christ, and help people to, be, to look to Him as, our, as their their leader and their follower because they see his, his, his attributes, his principles, and his priorities being lived out through us. And so Mordecai, just by living out his principles, just simply rubs Haman up the wrong way. Haman is so upset that he has a conversation with the king. And they decide that this, or Haman decides that the simple way to deal with this is for him to build the gallows and he's going to now kill every Jew. That's his solution. Annihilation of all the Jews who were in captivity in the empire. So what happens is Mordecai now goes to Esther. And when he visits with Esther... They have a conversation, and they talk about the problem, and how best to resolve the problem. But I want you to notice something that's, that's very important, a very important part of the story. Here is the conversation in Esther chapter 4, verse 16. And Esther, I want you to understand, Esther is caught in a, in a, in a, in a two it didn't matter what she did, she was caught because if she did one thing, she was trapped, and if she did the other, she was trapped. Notice what she says. Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink, for three days or nights. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. I want you to notice that. Because it wasn't enough for Esther, because she was queen, just to walk into the presence of the king. There was a whole protocol in which the queen had to approach the king in order for the king to accept her. And if she didn't follow the protocol, it would result in her death. That's how serious it was. And so Esther, understanding this... Esther understanding the dilemma. It didn't matter if she went to the king directly or if she waited. The reality was there was a death sentence hanging over her head. You know, friends, today we deal with what I describe as crisis of belief. I believe there are points in our Christian experience that we can point to where you and I have this issue. Here is Esther. She, this is the point in the story where we see the relationship that she has with God. There's no mention of God's name here, but this prayer and fasting certainly wasn't to any other gods. So here is Esther and the Jewish nation. No, they understand the importance of turning to God. They understand the dilemma. They understand the challenge that they're facing. And they understand that God alone is the only one who has the ability to work through the situation for His honor and His glory. And you know, friends, in these crises of belief that we deal with, they're big and they're small. Sometimes we have major crises of belief. Sometimes, friends, there are situations, there are circumstances that happen in our lives where we question whether or not we have the ability to deal with that particular situation. Sometimes they're so big that we cannot see the other side. It doesn't matter which route we try to take through it. The reality is it's impossible in our mind to overcome it. Laura Schlesinger writes this. 
She says, even those people who espouse a belief in God still often resist and resent the notion of specifically commanded behaviors. People often want the benefits of having a God for personal requests or crisis interventions and may use being a believer as a way to increase status, respect, or trust from others. Entering into a relationship with God is not just about the rewards we receive in this world or the next, but rather how we show God that we are serious about our relationship with Him. Did you get that? Friends, we often live the first parts of her quote. We often live in a disbelief. We can't believe that God can do things. And yet God, the Almighty, is the one who created us. I always find it interesting that in the book of John chapter 1, as John is starting to describe the ministry of, God, uh, of Jesus Christ here on this earth, he begins by talking about Jesus who is our creator. And that, that how Jesus created, he actually says it was, it was from the lips, it, these words that came forth from, the, from, from Jesus, the words let there be that Moses recorded, those words they were emitted from the lips of Jesus, the Father and the Holy Spirit and Jesus. They were all together in creation. But the words, let there be, came from Jesus' lips. So how come we doubt whether or not God can do something big in our time? How can that be? If all he had to do is say, let there be, and he created this entire universe. Do you think that God has the problem, or do we have the problem? Here, Paul writes, our scripture reading this morning, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know, friends, this morning, Paul sums it up. The crisis of belief. It doesn't matter how big or small these things are. It doesn't matter whether it's an individual issue or a family issue or whether it's a corporate church issue. It doesn't make any difference. The reality is, whatever it is, we have to acknowledge that it's either us trying to do it by ourselves or Paul says that we look to God through faith and invite God to take control of the situation, the challenge, so that we can see him working it out and also being to the, getting to the point where he wants to reward us for the faith that we exhibit and demonstrate in our lives. You see, friends, in order to deal with a crisis of belief, we need to recognize a few things. The first is dealing with a crisis under, understands that we have to understand initially that we have to have faith. Faith is the way to counter a crisis. Faith is our relationship in action with God. You know, there are three components to faith. The first component to faith is we have to have a knowledge. We get the knowledge from the Bible. We share our experiences of God with one another. That's knowledge, but we test those experiences against the Bible. Academically, we have to know and understand who God is. But that is not enough. And so the Bible then says we have to believe. But you know, the interesting thing is that Jesus also tells us that the demons believe in the name of Jesus. So if belief were enough, that it only puts us at the same level of where the demons are. That's not enough. We have to go to the third level we have to take that knowledge and that belief and through the power of God living in us, we put that into practice. 
We live out what God wants to do through us so that every time we see a challenge that humanistically we know we can't counter or, or, or deal with, we don't have the ability. We recognize that we do because we go to God. God is, has the ability to conquer every issue that we face. That's faith. That's big faith. That's just that faith of a mustard speed seed allowing Jesus to put it into practice in a way that demonstrates he can do the big thing. Number two, it's God-sized. You see, friends, remember Jesus, the creator. He doesn't do things in a little way. He does things in a big way. If it's a little way, really, we can do that. He's given us the ability to do that. He expects us to do those things. But he wants us to acknowledge that he can do the big things. You know the one thing he won't do? He won't force himself into your heart. He has to be invited. He could do it, but then we would be robots. And God doesn't want us to be robots. He's given us free will, and he's expecting us to utilize that free will for his honor and glory. But the reality is he's inviting us to put that free will into practice so that we can see God-sized things happening through faith in our lives. Number three, this is so important. What we do in response to God's revelation to us reveals what we believe about God. How we live our lives. You know, friends, one of the biggest mistakes we make is sometimes we believe that just because we say that we're a Christian or a Seventh-day Adventist, we believe that in some way that has absolved us from anything else. And the reality is that what that means, and that translates into this, we come to church one day a week and we, we're very pious on that one day, but then the other six days we're doing our own thing. That's how... That's how, it, that's how we can easily fall. The reality is that when we're doing our own thing during those other six days, we're really truly saying who we are. Are we seven-day-a-week Christians or are we seventh-day Christians? We're seven-day-a-week Christians. Christianity is not something you can switch on and off at a whim. Christianity is something where God expects us every single day, every single minute, every single facet of everything that we're doing to dedicate it to His honor and glory and invite Him into our lives. Amen? To demonstrate that He can do things. And if we're going our own way, if we're doing our own thing, the reality is that we're misusing the name of Jesus because we're not Christians. Number four, true faith requires action. It requires putting that knowledge and that belief into action. Do you know, Ellen White, I love the computer. Right. Because today we can do searches so easily. Back in the good old days, we would get the indexes out and we would go and search a word and, and hope that whoever had compiled the index had done a good job. And the reality was that they hadn't. They only got some of the text. But the great thing today is that now we can go and do a search. And I did a search a, a, um, a little while ago on Ellen White's writings, and I discovered that she mentions faith 49,180 times. Yeah, wow. Do you, th you know, normally if God says something once, it, it should be enough to catch our attention, amen? If he says it twice, he's kind of raised his voice. By the time he's gone three times, he's shouting at us. But when he's shouting at us 49,180 times, you understand the importance of putting God's love into practice in our lives. Jesus understood the importance. Notice in Mark chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said this. Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Amen? God is not limited by us. In fact, here's what happens. God smiles when we do our own thing. God smiles and He just lets you do your own thing. He's not going to come in and force you to do His thing. 
He lets you go and do your own thing. But God continues with His priorities around us, over us. But He wants us to be part of it. He's wooing us to Him because He wants us to enjoy the partnership of working in harmony with our God on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why Jesus says, for with God all things are possible. You see, friends, what we do tells the world about what we believe. That's why James writes this. He says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Friends, you can't live faith without putting it into practice. It's only a knowledge. It's only a belief until we choose to walk with God every single day. Several years ago, I was walking with my dad on the highest peak in Texas, the Guadalupe Mountain. And the interesting thing about the Guadalupe Mountain is that as you're hiking to it, you hike up the side of a canyon, and which is brutal because it's generally exposed to the sun. There's no vegetation on that side of that canyon. So you hike up the side of the canyon, then you get into a pinion pine forest, and, and you hike along for, and it's about six miles, I think, in, in total each way. Um, you hike for about another three miles in the um, in pinion pine forest, and that it's it's shaded, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. And then the last mile is, um, is basically exposed. You, you, you're going up to the, the rock on the top. And so we had, we had got to the point where, we, where the tree line ended and we were getting to that last stretch, that last mile. And standing there on the side of the trail were four guys. And, and they, were talk, they were talking amongst one another, and they were discussing the trail, they were discussing their hike, and they were discussing what they were going to do next. And they decided amongst themselves that they were going to turn around and go back. We went on past them after we greeted them. We went on past them. And after we had walked past them, probably you know, about another half a mile, um, we could see them. And we looked up and we could see the summit. It was just above us. And, and I waved at them and I shouted at them, my dad and I. And they turned around and they looked at us and we, sh we said, you're almost there. We can see it from here. They could see us. It was easy to walk to us. And they, they turned back and continued on the way back down the mountain. They were almost there. Putting faith, that knowledge, and that belief into practice were almost there until we say, Jesus, I want you to do amazing things in my life. Just some of the different stories in the Bible. The centurion, he was a Gentile. He knew that Jesus, the rabbi, didn't have to talk to him, and yet he went to Jesus by faith. The disciples in the storm, they're trying everything they can to protect themselves from the, and the boat from sinking, and then suddenly somebody, the light switches on in their brain, and they look at Jesus. He'd been doing all these miracles all over the place. They look at Jesus. He's sleeping there at the bottom of the boat. They turn to him and they say, Master, can you help us? Jesus was waiting for them. We have to reach out. And when they did, Jesus took care of the storm. And then there was the woman who came to be healed. All she needed to do, she knew in her mind, was just touch the edge of the cloak and Jesus was going to heal her. She knew it. It was faith. And then the blind men, they went to Jesus too and Jesus healed them. You know, friends, the story is littered with examples of Jesus with even the most minuscule amounts of faith, with Jesus healing people. That's what he's in the business of. Jesus is in the business of restoration. Notice 
how Gary Parker describes it this way. He says, if faith never encounters doubt, if truth never struggles with error, if good never battles with evil, how can faith know its own power? In my own pilgrimage, if I had to choose between a faith that has stared doubt in the eye and made it blink, or a naive faith that has never known the firing light line of doubt, I will choose the former every single time. Friends, what decision do we have to make today? The reality is that we have only one decision, and that is, I'm going to jump these slides, one decision for Christ. Amen? Here it is. Esther understood this. Number one, God is in control. Can I hear an amen? amen? God is in control. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have been blessed. We have been blessed knowing what Jesus' prophecies tell us. What they tell us is that God, who is in control, as, as we get closer to the end of time, withdraws his presence in order to allow the devil to more fulfill his plans and his purposes for this world. But God, let us not misunderstand this, God is always in control. Amen? Amen? He always has control of this world. And it starts, David understood, from the principle of a personal relationship with God. Notice Psalm 23, verse 1. You remember memorizing these texts. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Friends, God doesn't want us to want. He wants us to look to him. Notice this next text from Psalm 146, verse 7. Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. Friends, it is God who it provides for us. It is God who gives us everything that we need. And no matter what has happened to you in your lifetime, no matter how you were wronged or how th things went against you, God, who is in control, will always put it right in his time and in his way. Jeremiah 31, verse 35, Jeremiah writes these words, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. Amen? God is in control. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He's the maintainer of life. But most of all, he woos us to him. So we don't just see him as a God that is divorced and removed, but he is a God who is personal to you and to me. Amen? Number two. Oh, hold on a second. One other text I'll read as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Paul writes these words. He says, For it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. What a beautiful promise, amen? God's plans are only the best for you and for me. He's just looking for you and me to, to ascribe ourselves to his plans and his purposes. Number two, don't forget that Christ brought you to be a child of God. You know, friends, one of the most important things you can do in the morning um, is as you're looking in the mirror, look at yourself and say, I am a child of God. God bought me with a price. Jesus Christ came and died on the cross. And when he died on the cross, he gave us the firm assurance that when he returns in the clouds of glory, he will come back to, to accept us because we have accepted the grace that he has offered to each one of us. Can I hear an amen? Notice this text, Romans chapter 8, verses 15 to 17. Paul 
writes these words. He says, and I want you to notice, well, I'm going to get into this. I want you to notice these words. He says, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. I want you to notice that because he's very specific on the, the use of the words that he's using to describe God. He's describing God in a very personal um, relationship to you and to me. This isn't a God who is seeking revenge and vengeance and all the other things. This is a God who loves us because he created us to spend eternity with him. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit is involved in the process. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Friends, God has a plan for you and me. The world wants you to believe that you were just some evolutionary process. Amen? The Bible tells us that we were created in the image of God and that God had a plan for you and for me to spend eternity with him. And then the Bible tells us what God has done down through the pages of time in order to restore us to him. And he's offering and inviting you and me to spend eternity with him. What a beautiful promise that is, amen? Every one of us, child, were bought with a price. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, Paul say, writes these words, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. When Jesus returns in the clouds of glory, what a day that will be. And, and when Jesus returns, you and I, he says will be called his sons and his daughters. Friends, you're not an evolutionary monkey. You are heirs of Jesus Christ. Amen? You and I are heirs of God, who is our creator. Lastly, God's promises are trustworthy. I find it very interesting in the story of Esther, because as Esther and the Jewish nation go out to pray, as they're praying, they knew that God would vindicate them. He would take control of the situation, and that's what happened. God took control of the situation. Esther was able to petition the king and explain what was going on. The king was so horrified that he put um, Haman to death. But he didn't just stop there. You remember Mordecai? We talked about Mordecai. He should have received a reward. Mordecai got a reward. And that reward at that point in time was to receive everything that had belonged to Haman. He was rewarded. God put right the injustice in his time and in his way. Friends, the Bible tells us to not fear. I want to share two last promises from the book of Revelation. Notice these, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. No matter what we face, the promise is we will receive a crown of life when Jesus returns in the clouds of glory. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before the angels. Friends, Jesus is calling you. He's calling me. He wants us to enjoy living life, a life with him. He wants us to see that he has the ability to overcome all the crises, all the obstacles, all the challenges, whatever we want to call them, everything that we deal with. He wants us to understand that he's completely in control. And all he's looking for from you and me is that we put our faith and our trust 
in him. God bless you.